So thank you for coming. My name is Susan Knight. Welcome to Science on Tap, Manaqua. Science on Tap is a direct result of the Wisconsin idea, an idea conceived in 1905 that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. The co-sponsors for Science on Tap are Manaqua Public Library, UW Trout Lake Station, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, um, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, that's the, uh, boy, I always get that wrong, Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, sorry guys, and of course the Manaqua Brewing Company. And as always, we set this up as a discussion and not as a lecture. We'll have about 15 minutes of comments from our speaker, and then we open it up for questions. We should have a great program tonight. Before we get going, though, um, this is our two-year anniversary. So that's why we have balloons. Woohoo! We have had, you guys have been part of 19 programs. We have had 2,105 people attend. An average attendance is 111, and that's excluding our mining forum that we had last year uh, in June. Online, we have even more people. We've had 2,500 people have watched some part of these programs online, more than 500 hours of viewing. We've had people viewing us from the US, of course, Great Britain, Canada, Germany, and Australia. The most popular ones, I should have turned this into a trivia question. What do you think the most popular one was? This is online. Vitamin D, remember that one, about a year ago. Uh, this uh, deer management and ticks. Those were our three most popular. So I want to remind everybody that we, there are four ways to watch Science on Tap. You can watch right here like you are right now. That's the most fun way. There's also live streaming at the Monaco Public Library with uh, Mary Taylor where you can have root beer and pretzels. Um, there's also live video streaming for anyone with an internet connection. So all you have to do is go to our website, Science on Tap Manaqua, and click uh, Watch Science on Tap Live. So you could watch right now from your own home, even if you were vacationing in Florida or something like that. Um, you can also watch any event later. So go to the same website, uh, Science on Tap Manaqua, and click Watch Archived Video. So anyway, our next event that will be on in March is Heart Health with Dr. Michael McGill uh, from right here in uh, Manaqua, the Marshfield Clinic Lakeland Center, um, talking about heart health. That will be great. Okay. Now, before I go on into our speaker, I have one more announcement, and that is to let you folks know about MOOCs. How many know what a MOOC is? A MOOC is an M-O-O-C, very appropriate name for Wisconsin. These are massive open online courses, MOOCs. And they're all over the country, and University of Wisconsin is no um, stranger to them. They have them as well. These are completely free. They are classes that are offered online. You just have to sign up, and you can participate. Now, Wisconsin has several of them, but they have a special one starting this February. It's changing weather and climate in the Great Lakes region. Um, the two presenters will be Steve Ackerman and uh, Margaret Mooney. And Steve Ackerman, some of you may know from the Larry Mueller show, he's one of the weather guys who's on once a month. Uh, great guy, Boston accent, you probably are familiar with him. Anyway, so it's, there are four presentations. They take on one season a week, um, winter, spring, summer, fall. But the, what makes this MOOC especially special is that one of the presenters, Margaret Mooney, is going to come to the Manaqua Public Library every Thursday for the course of this and um, conduct a discussion in person. So that will be really pretty extraordinary. So they're doing, this is a little experiment for MOOCs. Usually there's no, um, you don't go anyplace or do anything in person, you just do it online. But in this case, um, you watch it ahead of time and then you have the discussion. If you are interested, please, you can, uh, there's a, um, go to the Manaqua Public Library website and you can see all about this. And if you want to be part of the discussion, please just let Mary Taylor know and um, she will be able to uh, tell you more about it. So that starts later this month, February. It actually starts on February 23rd, the first 
discussion group is February 26th. So um, please uh, learn more about that at the Minocqua Public Library website. Okay, so without further ado, tonight we have Steve Deller, who is a professor of agriculture and applied economics, and he's going to talk about the Northwoods economy. Steve Deller, um, he confessed to me before we barely even knew each other that he's from Illinois. <laughs> he spent a whole bunch of years at the University of Maine, but he was lured back to the Midwest by, to Wisconsin by great academics, his family, and his beloved Bears. I would go that far. <laughs> Deller's research follows the important economic issues in the state, state of Wisconsin, and his interests change when the state issues change. He cuts straight through the politician's rhetoric. He'll tell you his opinion of trying to attract outside businesses to the area. He'll give you the real scoop on the multiplier effect of new jobs. He'll tell you what communities like the North Woods can do to best help themselves. Overall, he wants to help people make more informed decisions. One example of his engagement with local economies is his interest in the economics of mining, especially sand mining related to fracking in the southern part of the state. Tonight, he's going to talk about the US, the Wisconsin, and the Northwoods economies, all in about an hour and a half. So, all right, this is audience participation time. One of the things Steve Deller may discuss is how important local business ventures are at improving the local economy. So I have a few modest ideas that I think might have some potential. So let me know which one you think is the best idea. Here's number one. Joint venture between Lazy Boy and Skidoo to create more comfortable snowmobiles. <laughs> Their motto could be live life comfortably on the trail. Number two. Turn all of our paved bike trails, I see Steve Peterson out here, turn all of our paved bike trails into moving sidewalks. So, so no one has to do any of that pesky exercise. The motto could be, we move so you don't have to. The last idea is drones. Deliver peer, beer and pizza by drone to your ice shanty. Give us your position and we'll send you nutrition. All right. Professor Steve Deller. Well, one thing I can, I can comfortably say is the bears still suck. <laughs> um, hopefully, hopefully with the new, never mind. Um, you know, I, I, when I came in, I was wondering, this is a really nice venue. I really like this, but it's like, where's the screen for the PowerPoint? Oh, we don't do PowerPoints. Oh, God, you just took my crutch away. Um, the other thing, too, is this, this is the only community meeting I've been at when several people have come up and said, do you want a beer? <laughs> it's like, no, you don't want to give the speaker a beer. Um, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is really kind of what's happening to the national economy, what's happening to Wisconsin, and then give a little insight in terms of where we think the economy is going to be going into the future and then kind of an overview of what's happening to the, to the Northwoods from an economic perspective. Now, when you think about measuring the economy, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? GDP. That's the granddaddy of all measures of, of economic growth. And GDP is actually doing quite well, thank you very much. Um, last quarters came out with a little bit lower than expected. It came out about 2.5%, which was less than they expected. But if you look at the quarterly change in GDP over the past 14, 15 years, it averages about 2.5%. Okay, now that includes the Great Recession, but the growth rate for the national economy is generally around 3%. We're fairly happy with that. So if we get anything above 3%, we're doing very well. So that's one measure. What's another measure that we generally use? Unemployment, Unemployment rate. Um, Unemployment is something that we pay a lot of attention to. How many of you remember um, during the recall the debate about what's the correct unemployment number? Right? Well, one of the things that we economists take great pride in is that if you give us long enough time, we can make the numbers say anything you want them to say. <laughs> okay? And I think that one of the things that was going on with a lot of the policy debates is that people, you know, they were trying to create confusion. They were trying to confuse people to kind of say, you know, don't look here, look here. 
and um, as a result, people kind of got confused. Economics, I mean, it's the dismal science, right? Um, so a lot of people just kind of say, well, they don't know what they're talking about. They, they teared it off. They stopped listening, which I think is a shame. Okay. But the unemployment rate, again, if you look at the monthly unemployment rate for Wisconsin over the past 24, 25 years, the average unemployment rate is about 5.1%. What do you think it is for the nation? 6.1%. Okay. So Wisconsin has historically had an unemployment rate that is below the national average, almost uniformly. Over that entire time period, there were only a couple of quarters there where the U.S. unemployment rate was actually below the Wisconsin unemployment rate. Okay? Now, if you look at how it's changing over time, it's coming down quite nicely. Thank you very much. Okay? So the unemployment rate's doing, it's, it's coming down. The question that economists have is what is kind of the ideal unemployment rate? Some economists say it's around 4%. Some say, no, it needs to be a little bit higher than that. Generally, there's, will we ever see zero unemployment? No, because there's always a churn in the economy. There's always businesses that are opening. There's always businesses that are closing. So there's a natural churn. The question is, what is that natural rate? About 4%. Well, we're still a little bit, of, we're a little bit away from that. Okay, so we still have a little bit to do with the unemployment rate. The other one is job growth. Okay, and there, Wisconsin has, if you look at the national economy, job growth is to a point where we are at a point where we were before the Great Recession. Okay, so we're back up to where we were, and we're actually a little bit above it. Wisconsin, we're not back yet to where we were before the Great Recession. Okay, we're, our recovery has been slower than the national recovery. Okay, we could talk about why that might be. Okay, the other thing that we spend a lot of time looking at is income. And one of the big problems that this recovery has had, and actually, it's getting a lot of media attention now, but economists have been worrying about this for 30 years, is the winding income gap. Okay? A lot of discussion about um, most of the growth in income has been occurring at the top 1%. And indeed, if you really want to get into it, I mean, it's not the top 1%, it's the top 0.1%. Because where almost all the income growth is occurring. Middle income, where all of us are at, it hasn't really been growing for the last 20 years. Okay? And that's a real concern. Okay? Is that the jobs that we're generating, are not, we're not seeing an increase in wages. And that's a real concern. And that's not just Wisconsin, that's the national economy. And we're starting to get some discussion now about whether or not this income distribution is an issue or not. And we can talk about that if you want to. Okay, so the economy is coming back. Wisconsin's lagging behind a little bit. We're not doing as good on, uh, on income as we would like. But what does the economy look like it's going? One of the things that the Wall Street Journal does is that they do a survey every month of 50 different economists from around the country that do economic forecast. Now, I will tell you, any single economists will never get their forecast right. If their forecast is right, it's random luck. Okay? But what the research has suggested is that if you get a bunch of economists in the same room and you take an average, that average is usually pretty good. And that's what the Wall Street Journal does. Okay? So what do you think the forecasted growth rate in gross domestic products is going to be over the next couple of years? Well, what the economists are saying is that it's going to be less than 3%. Okay, so we're not quite up to that growth rate of 3, 3.5% three that we would like to see, but we're doing better. Okay, we're doing better. Okay, the other thing is the unemployment rate. Um, the forecast here goes out to December of 2016, and the average forecast has an unemployment rate still slightly above 5%. Okay, so we're still not getting down to that point where we feel comfortable with the unemployment rate. Okay, so that still has a ways to go. Uh, consumer price index. Uh, last month, the consumer price index actually went down. Inflation went down. Deflation. Well, part of that is the price of gasoline. Now, what's wrong with deflation? From an economic perspective, what's wrong with not inflation, the opposite of inflation, deflation? What's wrong with that? Bingo. Bingo. Exactly. I'm thinking of buying a new refrigerator, but wait a minute, prices are going down. If I wait till tomorrow, it'll be cheaper tomorrow. If everybody starts thinking that, what do we do? We stop spending. And what happens to our economy? 
boom. Okay, deflation is a more of a danger than inflation. Okay, and our inflation rate has been very, very, very low. Uh, the forecast is is that we're going to be we're going to be around two percent inflation, which is practically nothing. Okay. Now, interest rates. How many of you refinanced your home in the last year? What kind of rates did you get? You don't need to tell me specifically, but... Low three. Low three. That's like giving money away. Okay, I had to... My daughter went off to college and she took my car with her. So I needed to buy a new winter car. And I, when I went to finance it, it's a four, it's a four year loan, right? It's, it's a, a winter car, so it was, was $10,000 for the car. The interest payment over that four years is $800. That's like free money. You know, maybe I'll buy two cars. Um, so what's going to happen to interest rates? Economists have been saying for a long time now, for the past two, three years, is that interest rates are going to be going up. They've got to go up. We've been saying that for two years now, three years now, and they have not been going up. That tells you how much we know. Okay? But the forecast is two years out, interest rates should be around 3.75%. Okay? So that 3% that you got low threes was actually pretty good because they're going to start inching their way up. The problem is, is that a lot of the interest rates are determined by monetary policy. What's the Federal Reserve Bank going to do? Okay? Right now, their federal funds rate, which is the rate that the Federal Reserve sets for banks to be able to loan money back and forth to each other, is right now 0.2%. An interest rate of 0.2%? That's 0.2%. Okay, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the banks to, to loan more money. Okay, they're making it cheap. That's the phrase, they're printing money. Okay, the forecast is that those interest rates are going to go up to about 2% over the next two years. But that's monetary policy. We don't know what they're going to do. But we've been saying that interest rates are going to be going up. And we've been saying that for three years and we've been wrong. Okay? Now, one of the things that they ask, the Wall Street Journal asks these forecasters is, what is the one thing that could really mess up your forecast? And in this particular year, almost three out of four identified the exact same thing. What do you think that is? Nope. Mm. Weaker global economy. The U.S. economy is doing very well, thank you very much. We have a little ways to go, but we're doing okay. What's happening to Europe? Europe's on the verge of another recession. South America's on the verge of a recession. China, the growth rate in China has dropped down to 6%. That's like unheard of. They're used to double-digit growth rates. There's a fear that the global economy is on the verge of going back into another recession. That could drag the U.S. down with it. Okay? That's the biggest fear. Okay? So what are some of the things that are going on? One is interest rates will be increasing. Energy prices should be declining and then stabilizing. There's some indication that it's kind of bottomed, oil's kind of bottomed out around $50 a barrel and will stay there for a while. Okay? Uh, the U.S. economy should remain strong, but the rest of the world economy is at risk. Uh, the U.S. dollar is going to be stronger, okay? which means if you want to go to Europe, now is the time to go, because your dollar will go farther. Okay? At least that's what I'm trying to tell my wife. Okay? <laughs> now, the downside of that is exports will go down. Our ability to export goods will go down. Now, this is a concern for farming because an increasing share of the Wisconsin farming economy is exported. Okay? It's, it's still not the majority, but it's, 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 a, it's a growing share. And there's some concern in agriculture that that export market's going to be getting tighter and tighter. Okay? Now, what about the North Woods? Um, when I put this together, I kind of grouped together a couple of different counties. Ashland County, Florence County, Forest, Iron, Langlade, Lincoln, Oneida, Price and Vilas. It's kind of a natural cluster to me. Okay, so those are the, that's the region I'm going to be talking about here. When you look at, you know, the, the first indicator that you want to look at is what's happening to population. Um, population since about 2000 has been basically declining in the region. Okay. Um, we could get into why that might be, but that is something that is, you know, when I looked at this and saw that population is steadily declining in the region, 
that is a real red warning flag to me. And I think that's something that we may want to talk about why that is occurring. Okay. Um, employment growth. Actually, from the 19, about 1984, 85, up until about the year 2000, employment in the Northwoods was growing very rapidly. It was growing stronger than the state, was growing stronger than the U.S. Then, in about 2000, it kind of went flat. There was no growth until we hit the Great Recession. And we lost a lot of jobs. We're starting to see a little bit of a tick back but the Northwoods is not back to where it was before the Great Recession. Okay, now that's something that we, I think we should be concerned about. Why is that? Okay. Now if you look at income, income, per capita income, for the Northwoods has always been below Wisconsin. And has always been below the national average. Okay. Indeed, if you look at comparing the North Woods to, to a U.S. average, in 1970, which is where my data starts, it was about 75% of the national average. Okay, that's pretty low. Today, it's up around 85% of the national average. So it's going in the right direction. Per capita income's going up, but it's still really below the national average, and it's below the Wisconsin average. Okay, now that's a question for concern. That goes back to that income equality question that we were talking about. What's the kind of wages that are, that the jobs that we are generating, what kind of wages are they paying? Okay. Now, where do you think most of the income in the region comes from? Do you think it comes from work? Retirement. Social Security. Okay. In Wisconsin, about 50% of all income comes from wages and salaries. In the Northwoods, it's less than 40%. Okay? Government transfer payments, which include Social Security, okay? for Wisconsin, it's about 15%. For the Northwoods, it's about 27, 28%. Okay? A lot of that has to do with retirement income. Okay? Is that a strength? Is that an opportunity? What does that mean for us? Okay? Now, where do you th what one sector of the economy, do you th of the Northwoods, do you think is the one single largest source of employment? Nope. Nope. Education. State and local government. Okay, and that includes K-12 education. A lot of times when you get into smaller communities like this, who do you think the largest single employer is? It's the school system. Almost uniformly, it's the school system. Now that has ramifications because if um, upwards of 14, 13, 14 percent of employment is state and local government, public sector employees, the decisions that are being made in Madison has a direct influence on a lot of the jobs are in this area, okay? Uh, Act 10, whether you believed in it or not believed in it from a purely economic perspective, it had an economic impact in the area, okay? What do you think the second largest is? Retail trade, which makes sense, okay? And that's a strength, that's partially the tourism sector, okay? State and local government said that one. Um, what do you think comes in at number three? This surprised me. Manufacturing. Almost 11% of employment in the, in the area is in manufacturing. Hmm? No. Logging, actually, um, uh, my dad, forestry, fishing, and related activities, 1%. 1%. But it's a strength for the area. It's a strength, but it's only 1%. Another sector that is, and I was advised by some people not to mention this, but one of the real strengths for the area in terms of its share of employment is mining. When you compare mining activities in the North Woods compared to the rest of the state of Wisconsin, it's fairly high. 
Well, what share of employment do you think mining accounts for? Hmm? Half a percent? Real damn close, 0.4%. Okay, so it's a strength, but it's really tiny. Okay? Healthcare and social services, that's 10%. Okay? And that's about where you would expect to be compared to the state average. Okay? So the strengths, the sectors that are really kind of strong are construction, uh, real estate, rental, and leasing. Well, that makes sense because of the recreational housing market here. Retail trade, state and local government. Farming is 3%. Uh, transportation and warehousing is 3%, 3.5%. So those are kind of the big ones in terms of a comparative advantage. Okay? Now, what's been happening to accommodation and food services? When you think about tourism, that's really what you think about is accommodation and food services. It is a strength, but what's happening to that strength over time? It's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Indeed, when you go back and you look at the sources of employment, and the job loss that occurred during the Great Recession, a lot of it came out of accommodation and food services. Okay? That's one of the things about a tourist-based economy. There are three sectors of the economy that are really sensitive to downturns in the economy. One is manufacturing, okay? particularly consumer goods manufacturing. The second is construction. The third is tourism. Okay? Because if you're going to, you know, if your job is at risk or you've lost your job, what are you going to cut back on? Well, you're not going to replace that refrigerator. You're not going to buy a new car. You're not going to do that remodeling job. And you're going to postpone that vacation. Okay? So that's something that I think the region needs to worry about. Okay? The other thing is when you start looking at wages, wages per job, the average wage per job for the region, for the typical job, is about $35,000. What do you think it is for accommodation and food services? Pretty close, 18,000. 18,000. A lot of that's probably seasonal. That's why it's so low, is because it's seasonal. Okay. What about retail trade? Actually, it's higher. It's up around 25,000. That's more of a year-round type job. Okay. This goes back again to the question of the types of jobs that we're generating. What kind of wages are they paying? Okay. So, bottom line. One of the things that jumped out at me when I did the analysis is what's happening to population in the area. Tremendous amount of population decline, and that's not really recovering. That's a concern. That's something I think we need to think about. Income levels may be a concern. What are the types of wages that are being generated by the jobs that are, that are here? The tourist economy could be stronger. Okay? And you've got to focus on small businesses. Because I think that the future of economic growth and economic development in the region in the future is going to be tied to small business development. And I will leave it at that. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Carol is going to wander around. Oops. Oh, I shouldn't have turned it off. There we go. There you go. Okay. Do we have some questions? Just on the last one, what's the uh, average decline in population in, in the U.S.? The average decline in population for the area? Compared, compared to here, yeah. Give me a minute here. Give me a minute here. The average growth in population for Wisconsin is about 2% per year. Okay. For the nation, it's about three, a little more than 3%. Okay. For here, I'll do the math in my head real quick, you're looking at less than 1%. Indeed, you're looking at half a percent average growth rate here. So, and a lot of that has been a decline in the last, a decline in the last 10 years. Has the um, age class changed with the population? You know, that's one, thing I did, I did, that's one thing I didn't look at and I should have looked at is um, what's happening to the age profile. And I think, uh, based on some other work that I've done, um, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an older population. It's an aging population. Um, and I think that, that there's a couple of things that are driving that. 
one is employment opportunities for youth, um, you know, kind of the brain drain argument. I think the other thing is the amount of retirement migration. When you think of when you think of retirement destination areas in the U.S., where do you think? Florida, Arizona, places like that, the <laughs> Gulf Coast. Actually, northern Wisconsin and northern Michigan are actually retirement destination areas. Now, why is that? They like the weather. <laughs> it's 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 their recreational homes. What they're essentially doing is that uh, you know we've kind of studied this, and there's a kind of a pattern that occurs here is that people kind of go into a region for vacation, uh, maybe camping, fishing, things like that. They like the area. They buy a piece of property, they build a cabin on it, and over time that cabin turns into a four season house, and they retire to it. Um, I think that before the Great Recession, you actually saw tr a fair amount of growth in retirement migration into the area. But when the stock market crashed, a lot of that retirement ideas, a lot of people put off their retirements. So I think now that the stock market's coming back and um, you know, people are feeling more secure that way, I think you're going to start to see more of that retirement migration coming back into the area. Hi. Uh feel like our level of broadband here is like pretty bad compared yeah. to other parts of the state and country. How much does that affect the ability to bring good companies or jobs here? In this it's, it's a real bottleneck. Um, for most small businesses, having access to broadband internet has become vital. Uh, it's almost like a necessary condition. If you don't have a presence on the web, you don't exist. And without having access to broadband, that really puts the community at a comparative disadvantage. Um, there, and it, it's, it's really starting to become an economic development issue. A lot of times it's talked about in terms of, you know, well, the schools need access to it, the hospitals need access to it. It's turning into an economic development because it's, it's, it's become a bottleneck for a lot of these rural areas. Um, there's a, there was one firm in uh, Baraboo uh, that I was talking with, and it's a, it's a call center. It's one of those ones that you dread getting the call, you know, right as you're sitting down at dinner. And they grew from a local company, locally started, and they grew up to about 200. And they tapped out their local market, okay, a pool of people coming in. So they thought, oh, well, what we'll do is that we'll set people up in their homes, okay, home-based businesses. Okay, so we'll contract you, and you can work out of your home, and you will work three hours a day. And we'll schedule you when you work those three hours a day. And I, bingo, we got it right? It fell flat on its face. Why did it fall flat on its face? Broadband. These houses didn't have access to broadband. Okay? I think that's a really contentious issue. And I think that one of the things that a lot of communities were looking at was trying to develop their own kind of broadband utility cooperatives. And unfortunately, the state stepped in four years ago and basically banned that. And so that's unfair competition. So one of the strategies that a lot of smaller rural communities were looking at is saying, we'll do it ourselves. The state stepped in and said, you can't do that, uh, which is a real, just making it even worse. The other problem that we've got is that we've got a lot of high, sp we've got a lot of fiber optics running across the state, okay? But the problem, though, is that that fiber optic is plugging into old copper systems. Collegamon described it as what, what the state did is that they built a Ferrari engine, and then they used a toothpick as the drive tra uh, drivetrain. You know, it just it just doesn't work. So this is something that I think that um, communities really need to be a little bit more uh, vocal in terms of getting policies changed so that local communities can actually set up cooperatives that can set up their own utilities to try to provide these types of things. But you still have the physical cost of running that infrastructure out there, and who's going to do that? That was set by the legislature. And I don't know if that happened before Walker came in or after Walker came in, but it was done by the legislature. Essentially, the, uh, the cable companies, the internet providers, essentially went in and said, this is unfair competition. And they said, okay, fine, we'll ban it. One of the running jokes, I guess, is that um, everybody who lives in southern Wisconsin, lawmakers, leaders, academics, 
thinks that everything north of Highway 29 is kind of just the same. And I know, like, when I think about Lang Lake County versus Vilas Oneida, to me, those are two extreme, very different landscapes economically. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to that at all, or did you, you know, were you able to take some time to look at that? You get, not only is the, the economics different, but the culture of the communities are different. And, um, you know, I debated when I kind of grouped the counties together about where to stop and whatnot, and I kind of, you know, just went with that region. Um, I think if you, if you broke out the counties from a purely economic perspective, I think they'd look more similar than you think. But I think what the difference is, is the cultures across the different regions are very, very different. Some places in northern Wisconsin are very, um, they like it just the way it is, thank you very much. And there are some places in northern Wisconsin that are a little bit more progressive, and I don't mean progressive in a political sense, but progressive in the sense of wanting to do something different. Okay. Now, from an economic development perspective, uh, what we kind of say is, we, we kind of call that uh, entrepreneurial communities. Some communities are um, very kind of entrepreneurial. They want to try new things. They want to try something different. They want to learn from their mistakes. They keep trying. Okay. Other communities are very much, we like it just the way it is. And we're not going to change it very much. Um, I think that you see tremendous variation across the northern state across that dimension. No comment. <laughs> I think any place that is, you know, you have several people say, here, you want a beer while you're talking? I think that, that's all, that's all I need to say. All right, thank you. Um, is there a perception among um, near or um, uh, pre-retirees or uh, a trend seen that with the dilution of the money supply and low interest rates that there'd be an acceleration of these folks to uh, accelerate their retirement plans? I think so. I think you're going to start to see it accelerate now. With the stock market the way it's going right now, um, I think you're, you'll start to see more people moving that, that, that retirement migration pattern starting to return stronger. Um, I think that, you know, everybody, the stock market was doing so well and everybody was doing so good um, and property values were through the roof and everybody felt so wealthy. And then, you know, it's like we can, early, we can take an early retirement, we can sell our primary house, we can make a killing on our primary house, we can move into our seasonal house, our recreational house, and maybe get an apartment down in Florida to spend January and February. Okay? But when the housing market collapsed, the stock market collapsed, suddenly people felt very poor. Okay? Most people, their primary asset from a financial perspective is their house. Now, people say you shouldn't look at your house as an investment. Mm, but for most of it, it is. I mean, what's your single biggest asset? It's your house. Okay? So when, this, when the housing market collapsed, you know, a lot of people just felt as though their wealth was just yanked out of their pockets. So they just hunkered down and they really decided they're not going to do anything. And I think that's partially what's, you know, what the area is suffering from. Well, as a follow-up to that one, would there, um, do you think the Northwoods is ready for a retiree onslaught, infrastructure-wise? Onslaught? <laughs> uh, the bears still suck. Um, I don't, I, th I don't think it's going to be an onslaught, but I think what you'll see is a, a, a change in the population dynamics. I think you'll see more retirees moving into the area. I think you'll see more retirees that are um, going to want to become active in the community. I think retirees are going to want to start volunteering their time. I think that they're going to want to uh, maybe run for public office um, and um, you know, maybe start a business. So I think that, that, you know, those retirees coming in, rather than thinking of the retirees are simply like folks that live here longer, is that they're going to be become part of the community. And that's a real asset. And that's, that's something that should be tapped into and embraced from a community's perspective. Now, that's the difference between an entrepreneurial community and a non-entrepreneurial community, is that if you see retirees moving in, that's a new, that's a, that's a new asset. How can we tap into that new asset? 
How can we get these folks involved in the community? How can we maybe get them convinced to start up a business? Okay, maybe even if it's part-time, that's fine. But starting up a business, okay? How can we get them involved in volunteerism? Maybe we can convince some of them to run for public office. Okay, that's an entrepreneurial community. A non-entrepreneurial community is like you, you're on the lake, you stay on the lake, and don't, don't come into town. Okay? So where'd the $4 trillion that the Fed pumped into the economy go? It kept us from going into a Great Depression. But where'd the money go? Where'd the money go? It's called this thing, the economy. You know, the, the economy is a multi-trillion dollar thing. And it, is, um, it essentially kept us from sliding backwards even farther. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you mean, though. Not really. Uh, they, were, they pumped it into the economy by buying bonds from the banks, right? Or buying treasury bonds back. Oh, yes. Or buying mortgages yeah. from the banks. Right. So what did the banks do with that money? And I don't believe they lend it <laughs> all out. Uh, if, if they would have spent $4 trillion on infrastructure, it would have had a much greater effect, I think, than buying bonds and mortgages. Okay, there's a couple of things that are going on here. What the Federal Reserve did when they were essentially buying debt, right, they were monetarizing the debt, they were buying U.S. Treasury bonds, okay? They were buying, they were basically financing the deficit is what they were doing, okay? They were also encouraging banks to loosen up. Now, one of the things that, um, if I had a PowerPoint, a slide I could show you a really amazing graph is um, cash on reserve for banks. Banks have to close the end of the day. They have to have a certain amount of cash on hand. Okay, it's just part of the, 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 the regulatory environment. And that's that federal fund rate is that some banks will have more cash on hand at the end of the day than they need and other banks will have less cash on hand. And the Fed will facilitate those banks borrowing back and forth. That's what the federal fund rate is. Okay. Now the problem, though, is that the, if you, you can look back, and they've been collecting this data since World War II, and if you look at the, the cash on reserves, it has always bounced right along what their requirements are, right? And then all of a sudden we hit the Great Recession. And what do you think happened to the amount of cash on hand? Boom! What happened is that banks are sitting on cash, particularly the big banks are sitting on cash. Okay, um, if they're sitting on cash, they're not loaning it. And by not loaning it, they're essentially putting a break on the economy. Okay, so you had two things going on. You had the Federal Reserve that was basically monetarizing the debt. That was helping to keep interest rates low. Because if the federal government went into the private, private markets to, you know, to finance the debt, you know, they'd have to pay higher interest rates and it would drive interest rates up. Okay, that's not good for the economy. So the Fed stepped in and said, we will buy that debt. We will buy those treasury notes, treasury bills, and keep interest rates low. Then you had the banks, the retail banks, that were essentially sitting on a ton of cash. Now, why were they sitting on a ton of cash? Well, I don't think people appreciate how close we came to going over the edge of a cliff with the Great Recession. I mean, we had a financial meltdown that was, um, who was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time? Um, Paul, thank, no, not Paul Volcker. He apparently is infamous for playing poker because he's got a poker face. No, not Green Street, that's Federal Reserve. Oh, Treasury Secretary. Henry Paul, thank you. Per no, yeah. Apparently he's notorious for playing. You, play, you don't play poker against this guy because he's got a fabulous poker face, right? When it first started hitting the fan, he went in and had an emergency meeting with Bush as president. And um, I was working at home, and I keep a, a, a CNBC on the background. And uh, you could tell all the business... Uh, reporters were saying something's going on because, it look, because when he came out of that meeting, he looks like he'd seen a ghost. And they said, uh-oh, something's up. And apparently what he had seen is that he had seen this thing starting to unravel and thought, 
we're on the verge. If we don't do something quick, we're going to go into another great, uh, great Depression. And I think that that scared a lot of banks. And what they do when they're scared and they're unsure of what's going on is they just sit on it. Okay. Now, you talk to the bankers. Do we have any bankers in the room? One, one. Okay. Not the small banks. Small banks are fine. It's the big banks. It's the big banks. Um, the bankers will say, well, no, it's the Federal Reserve came down on us. The Federal Reserve is over-regulating. The Federal Reserve has tied our hands. We want to loan money, but we can't loan money. Nah. I think what it is is the banks are just, we're just that scared, and they're sitting on a ton of cash. Now, the last time I looked at that number was about six months ago, and it had only come down a little tiny bit. So the banks are still sitting on a lot of cash. I might be wrong about this, but uh, decades ago, this area uh, was primary, uh, primarily a tourist economy uh, mm -hmm. with the supported by the traditional um, hospitality industries. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my experience, I think that's shifting, and it, it, it seems to be that we are shifting to a second home kind of economy. Yes. Can you... Can you tell us more about the nature of a second home economy and uh, how do local businesses capitalize on that shift? Two things. First of all, it's great for the construction industry, okay? Because whenever these recreational houses, they're being converted, they're being upgraded, they're using local contractors, okay? So that's a positive thing. That's why the construction industry is still a strong sector for, for the Northwoods. So that's one thing that's positive. The second thing that's a negative is that they don't spend money in the local economy. They bring everything from home, okay? So they don't go to the local grocery store and fill up, you know. They bring it all from home unless they, you know, forgot, forgot milk. Okay, we're going to go into town and get milk, okay? They don't spend money in the local economy. The key is how to get those folks to come into the local economy and to come into the community. And that's where that kind of entrepreneurial community of reaching out, so like the homeowners associations, and, and having um, uh, community festivals where you're trying to get folks to come into town. So it's not just okay, the lake people and the rest of us, but how do we get them to kind of blend together a little bit more? And I think that as you start to see more retirement migration in the area, and you get those retirees more actively involved in the local community, that will start to spill over. Okay. Now, a lot of recreational homeowners, they will be honest with you, I don't want to deal with that. I'm going on my lakefront property, I'm getting out of the car, I'm locking the car, and I'm not, you know, I'm here. Okay. The only time I'll go into town is that I've got to go to the hardware store to buy something. Okay. That's a very difficult thing to overcome. I'm not sure you can overcome that. Um, but it's a matter of trying to build that bridge between the lake community, the lake people, and the year-round residents. How do, you build, how do you build that bridge between the two of them? That's the challenge. And entrepreneurial communities can do that. Once that are not entrepreneurial, they'll never be able to do that. And that's the attitude of the community. I, I understand what you were saying about the banks hoarding the cash, but I think also manufacturing companies to a large degree are sitting on a great deal of cash uh, right now. And you can take uh, Apple out of the picture because they're sitting on so much it's crazy. But are, are the GEs and the other large manufacturing companies still uh, hanging on to a lot of cash? And is, are they also afraid uh, of what happened in the Great Recession? Yeah, what's happening with a lot of corporations is one of the things that's keeping the stock market as strong as it has been is stock buybacks. One of the things that's been different with this recovery is that usually when companies start to make profits, they start to invest. They start to expand. They, they expand their work pool. They expand their, you know, their, their business footprint, if you will. We're starting to see that come back. But throughout a lot of the recovery, what they were doing is that they were taking the profits that they were making and they were going back and buying their own stock because they were essentially driving the price of the stock up. Now, you can ask, you know, what is, what's the purpose of a corporation that has stock? It's supposed to be value to the stockholder. 
Well, one way to, to, to return value to the stockholder is to drive prices up. Okay? And one way to do that is to take their profits, not invest in expanding the business, but buy back stock, driving stock prices up. Okay? Now, the cynics would say, well, you look at most CEOs and their, benefit, or their, their compensation packages are based on stock prices. So if they drive their stock prices up, that makes their benefits or their, their bonuses bigger. That's the cynic. Oh, so STEM jobs are at like science, technology, engineering, math, engineering, mathematics, and professional services. Those are some of the higher paying jobs that you yes. can get in our economy, like national, nationally. If you were like the, the, the economic development guy in Manaqua, how would you try to get some of those jobs in this area? The one thing is to, um, well, two things. One is to provide an environment that's conducive to small business development, entrepreneurship, okay? Create an environment that provides training opportunities, learning opportunities, uh, an environment that provides networking opportunities, uh, an environment that says, okay, you know, how many times does it take your typical small business owner before they finally get going? Four or five. Four or five tries, okay? So it's saying, okay, you, you failed this time, but we can, you know, Let's keep going. That's one thing. The second thing is, is to sell the quality of life of the area, okay? Um, a lot of STEM workers, if you will, you know, they're young, they're professionals, they want to be where it's hip and happening and whatnot, but then they suddenly do, the, you know, they, they start a family, and suddenly their priorities shift, and they might be looking at something different. Now, can you create an environment that those STEM workers who say, I want to get out of the rat race, I want to get out of Silicon Valley because it's so expensive to live there, okay? I don't want to be in Chicago anymore because the bears suck, okay? <laughs> um, well, we'll talk about the Cubs. Um, can you create an environment that those kind of business people would look at this area and say, hey, I really like the, the quality of life here, the, the, the attitude of the community is embracing and try to recruit those folks to come into the area. That is a slow, long-term strategy, but it can, be, it can have a very long-term impact and it can be fairly sustainable. Okay? The problem, though, is that when we talk about economic development, oftentimes people tend to recruit economic development with recruitment. We've got to get businesses to move into the area. Okay? The problem, though, is that we just completed a study um, where we looked at the movement of Wisconsin businesses from 2000 to 2012 annually, okay? All businesses in Wisconsin. If they had a credit rating, we had data on them, okay? There's about 48, 480,000 businesses in Wisconsin. How many of those do you think actually moved at any time? 1%. Okay? Of that 1% that ever moved, how far do you think, that, you know, 60% of that 1% moved less than 10 miles. Okay? Because basically what they're doing is they start here, they grow, and they lose their lease, or they outgrow their space, and they move down, they move down a little bit. Okay? So the number of businesses that move is really small, almost infinitesimally small. Now, every community is trying to recruit those ones that do move. What are the odds of that being successful? Okay? Exactly. But why do we continue to do that? Because if, if, a, if, a, if a business of a 50 employees moved into the area, right, or you had 10 businesses, each one adding five jobs, which one do you think is going to get the attention? The 50, all right? So there's this perverse incentive to go after what gets the headlines and not after that more sustainable 10 businesses that are started here that are growing here, okay? So we kind of, we're kind of in that mindset of we got to play the game, we got to win the game, and that game is recruitment when it's a losing game. 
That's my soapbox. <laughs> Folks, we're going to take a quick five-minute break. Everybody get another beverage, and we'll be right back with you in five minutes. Thanks a lot. Well, I suppose I'll start. I've been living up here for about four and a half years now, five years, and I really like it, and I like the woods, lakes, rural aspect of it. And I wonder sometimes, I appreciate that, uh, you know, development and economic growth is important, but I wonder in areas like this if we are headed towards developing ourselves right out of the reason people come. You don't want to become the next Wisconsin Dells. Right. Um, I don't blame you for not wanting to become the next Wisconsin Dells. I think when I, when I talk about economic development, I like to talk about it in terms of economic opportunities. Okay, you want to try to create an environment that people feel as though they have choices. Okay, they feel as though um, if they want to stay and start their family here, they, they have that choice. If a retiree comes into the area and says, you know, I'd really like to start a business. I'm tired. I'm bored. I want to do something. Do they have those opportunities? Okay, so what we're really talking about is creating those types, an environment where people feel as though they have a choice, okay? And that's a little bit different than just simply talking about growth, because growth is more jobs, more people, more, 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 more. And that's not necessarily what communities want. What communities want is a, is a vibrant place, okay? It doesn't need to be bigger, it just needs to be vibrant. And that's that entrepreneurial community, okay? We like the size we are very much, thank you very much. But we still want it so that, you know, people can, uh, can earn higher wages if they want to. Okay, so it's creating an environment like that. Now, what brought you here? Center for Limnology, Trout Lake Station. <laughs> <laughs> don't you know the Wisconsin idea is a thing of the past? We don't need all that anymore. I plead the fifth. Yeah. What effect does the uh, $300 million... Um, proposed budget cut to the university going to have on the UW? Short term, it's going to be devastating. I mean, it's going to be really, really hard. I'm not sure that we can come up with that kind of, I'm not sure we can pocket that without doing serious cuts. Okay? Long term, if we are given public authority, Okay, that will create a lot of opportunities for us to be more cost effective. Okay? For example, some of the campuses were looking at significant budget cuts, and what they did is that they encouraged some of the more senior faculty to retire, and then we'll hire you back to teach a couple of classes. So say I'm a professor, I'm making $75,000 a year, I'm close to retirement, and they say, look, what we're going to do is that retire, and then we're going to hire you back to teach two classes, and we're going to pay you $20,000 a year to teach those two classes. Okay? The classes are getting covered. And how much does that save the cost of the taxpayer? $55,000. But what happened when it got out that some of these campuses were doing that? Double dipping. Okay, some of these, these Bat Cat University professors were double dipping. No, they weren't double dipping. What they were doing was saving the taxpayers a lot of money. Okay, we can't do that anymore. So when, if we get public authority, we can start to do things like that that will be much more sustainable in the long term. Okay? Short term, it's going to be really painful. Now, the problem, what I, the fear that I have is that we have to look at the two, the, 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 the the teaching campuses, my wife is at UW-Whitewater. She teaches at UW-Whitewater. That's a teaching campus, okay? They've already pulled the, you know, they don't have any more knots in the belt to pull tire, okay? So I'm not sure how they're going to do that, okay? But UW-Madison is a research institution, and the reputation of the institution is worth its weight in gold, okay? It takes decades to build a reputation. It takes a very short period of time to destroy a reputation, okay? So if word is out that uh, the people of Wisconsin don't value higher education, right, 
and you're trying to recruit a young star, a young research star who could be, you know, developing the next stem cell breakthroughs, right? And they're looking at coming to Wisconsin or going to, um, who should I, Michigan State University. Where are they going to go? Okay, so we, th 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 that's, that reputation, I'm afraid it's going to take a big hit, and it's going to take time to recover from that. You lose the research dollars that they would attract from the federal government also, right? The bench scientists do bring in lots of research dollars. Um, some of the bench science, in the College of Agriculture, we have biochemistry, we have genetics, um, and uh, some, of those, some of those folks, they bring in five, six million dollars a year, okay? Not every professor does that, okay? If you're in the, the uh, um, English department, you're not bringing in that kind of money, okay? So we need to be careful in making too broad of a generalities, um, but you're right. I mean, some of these, some of the research dollars that are being brought in are just, I mean, that's what keeps the university afloat. It's the indirects, okay? The National Science Foundation, if one of these geneticists brings in a $5 million grant from National Science Foundation, 46% of that is overhead, okay? That goes to the university. That overhead is what's used to basically pay for the janitorial staff, the secretarial staff, make sure that the phones are turned on, make sure that the lights are turned on, okay? If we lose that overhead, then we're really hurting bad. The other thing that happened is that, um, you know, the UW system is about a $6 billion enterprise. And we had a cash reserve of, what do we have, about 8% of that, which would be six. Six hundred million? Not quite that much. It wasn't that much, right? We had a cash reserve on hand. Okay, a lot of what that cash reserve on hand is. Let's say I pull in a ten thousand dollar grant. Okay, I'm an economist. I don't pull in multi million dollar grants. Okay, they don't pay me that kind of money to do that kind of work. Um, say I, I I do the research, I do the project, and I spend nine thousand of it. I got a thousand dollars left over. That $1,000 oftentimes is then goes into that surplus. It rolls over, okay? Now, when you've got that kind of research money coming in, you get a lot of money that's rolling over, okay? That surplus is what the university is able to kind of tap into to kind of make, make the numbers line up. Well, the state legislature said, you can't have that kind of money. So now that cushion, that cash in the bank that businesses have, we don't have that anymore, okay? So now, if I say get that $10,000 grant and I spend $9,000, I got $1,000 left, I either A, have to give it back to the funding agency, and that's just un-American, okay? Or two, I can spend it, okay? Which is silly, you know? I should be able to roll that over and in the next year and maybe hire a student in the next semester. I could keep going and going and going and probably dig myself into a big hole because you are taping it and it is being broadcast. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so you, you're saying some of the, uh, the, the industries that are going to be bigger here are retail trade, construction, um, there's a couple other ones you mentioned. Doesn't seem like four, two to four year college training types of jobs. Potentially yes or no, but the, the real question is what should we be encouraging our children if they want to live here and make money here, where should we be encouraging them to go? To, to, to tech schools, to for trade schools, or to you know, four-year schools? It, it depends on the student. I mean, there are some students that just, you know, um, they don't want to go to the university. They don't want to go to college. They don't want to do that. They don't have, you know, it's just, not, it's just not for them. So trying to shove them in that direction, I think, is a bad idea. And that's one of the things that I think the K-12 system is doing in the state of Wisconsin, which is bad, is that we used to have kind of two tracks, if you will. We had kind of the Votech track where you went to shop class and things like that, and then you had the college prep class classes. The problem, though, is that with all the budget cuts, those shop classes are extremely expensive to keep operating, 
right? It's much cheaper to shut down that shop class and hire another college prep English teacher, okay? So we're kind of disinvesting in that. Um, some people have said that that's where the technical schools can pick up, but, I mean, the culture of it is, think about when, when you were in high school, okay? If you had to get on a bus and go someplace else to take your classes, what does that do to you? You know, so it works in theory, but not in practice. Um, now, back to your question. Dave Markuler, a colleague of mine, has done a lot of work in, in tourism and whatnot. And the perception or the kickback on tourism is that they're crappy, low-paid jobs. Well, it depends. It depends on the ownership structure of the businesses. If the businesses are locally owned, some of those jobs can be pretty good paying jobs, okay? If they're chain operations, okay, like McDonald's or America Inn, you're right. The only jobs you get are those low paying, crappy jobs. So it depends on the ownership structure. So that's why that kind of growing locally owned businesses, like this place, okay, it's much more sustainable. This is, this is, this is you know, tourism, but I imagine that, you know, don't want to say anything, but I imagine that, you know, they're doing okay. You know, they're making a good, they're making a decent living at it. Okay? Are they going to be able to go out and buy a new Ferrari? Um, so it depends on the ownership structure. Okay? And going away to college and getting that life experience and then coming back and trying to start your own business um, or partner with somebody to start a business, I think is really the future of the economy. Well, I would just add to that really quickly that, I mean, these days, not all commerce or business relationships have to happen with people who are physically in your proximity. I mean, we have a growing, you know, network, a nationwide network of businesses that are, you know, it's becoming very commonplace to work remotely with one another. So... I mean, encouraging young people to be able to think outside the box and um, be interconnected uh, over long distances as a as a matter of course, or that you know, just to think that that could be normal. I mean, I'm an astrophysicist, and I've spent the whole winter up here, and I, <laughs> I'm working with NASA teams all over the country. And I'm not saying that because I'm bragging about myself and how awesome I am, <laughs> but I'm I'm making a point that. Um, there is a lot you can do in a small town like this other than, you know, sort of the usual things. And, and I mean, that's just one of, you know, a billion possible ways to make a living, I think. I, th I think you're 100% right. I think that that is, um, but broadband, you have to have access to broadband, okay? So that's, we go back to that question about broadband. So, yes, but we got that bottleneck, okay? I also think that we need to find out... When I was at the University of Maine, there was a town on the coast there, Camden, Maine. How many of you remember the old Peyton Place movie? The scenes that were shot of that beautiful, that was Camden, Maine, okay? There was a lot of uh, retirees that had moved into the Camden area. And for some reason, there was this cluster of retirees that were ex-CIA spies. <laughs> right? And the only reason I know this is because I was invited to do a workshop in Camden, Maine, and they took me out to dinner, and, you know, after a few cocktails, they started talking, right? Well, there, do you think these are the kind of guys that are going to sit on their porch and read a novel? No. I mean, they, so there is a little cluster of businesses there, of companies, of, of firms that do um, international security consulting, and it's all out of Camden, Maine, Okay. Who knows how that started? I think it was one person retired there. Word got back about what a great town it was, and it just kind of started snowballing. But those are the kind of opportunities that you want to try to take, you know, how do you build on that? There's one in the back. I kind of piggybacking the gentleman up top there. I, I think I heard you say earlier that uh, education was one of the better employers in the north. State, local government. 
Pardon me? State and local government, and, of which uh, K-12 education is a big piece of that. Okay, and so would you say that's typical for Wisconsin in general? Um, and well, my computer not, shut down. What Actually, it is. Actually, it is. About one out of ten jobs in the state is state and local government. Outside of state and local government education, what industries would you say stand out in other parts of the state uh, in terms of being good employers or, or growth industries? Again, it goes back to how you define growth. Look at manufacturing. Okay, Manufacturing is a growing sector in the state if you look at it in terms of gross domestic product. If you look at it in terms of jobs, it's not. Because a lot of the manufacturing, manufacturing in Wisconsin is going through a, 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 a kind of one of two phases. One is, is that they're getting more capital intensive. Okay? How many of you have ever visited a paper mill? Okay? Do you remember seeing the pictures of the paper mills back 50, 60, 70 years ago? There'd be 100 mechanics running up and down that machine. Right? Today, there's how many running up and down that machine? Maybe two. Okay? What's happening is that it's all computer controlled. Okay? So it's a shift. The industry is growing, but it's not employing as many people. Okay? That's one angle. The second angle is that a growing part of Wisconsin manufacturers are moving towards TEP agencies. They're hiring people on short-term basis. One of the fastest growing sectors in the state is the TEP agency sector. Okay? It's because businesses need to hire people. Okay, but they don't want to pay full wages, they don't want to pay full benefits, and they want to be able to essentially not make a long-term commitment to them. Okay? So we have this kind of movement towards, again, lower paying jobs. And that's one of the concerns that we have is this whole income distribution thing is that a growing number of the jobs that are being generated are not very good paying jobs. How does Wisconsin's tax climate inhibit our growth in manufacturing in, in many of these areas? Two things. One is, if you look at taxes in Wisconsin, property tax, sales tax, income tax, they are high. Okay? But if you look at our total revenue, we're about in the middle of the, of the 50 states. How can that be? Well, things like tolls. How many states have gone to tolls? Fees. What's the cost to register your car? Okay. When I lived in Maine, I had to take out a second mortgage to register my car. Okay. Because what other states are doing is they're staying away from taxes, property tax, income tax, sales tax, and they're moving towards fees and charges. Okay. We as a state have not done that. Okay? I remember when, um, um, the, when Tommy Thompson went to Washington, the, the lieutenant governor that stepped in. I said, I'll never make a good politician because I can't remember names. Thank you. Right? There was a line in the budget right, that was for public libraries. And it was something like $50 million. Right? If a public library took that money, the condition was that they could not charge fees. Okay? Everything in the library had to be free. Okay? What McCollum proposed is that, well, what we're going to do is that we're going to cut that money and we're going to allow libraries to now charge a fee for their services. How do you think that went over? It was like, oh my God, over my dead body, are you going to charge me for a library card? Okay? We in the state have, have a long tradition of paying for things through taxes and not through fees. My mother, um, again, I'm from the Chicago land area, and uh, before my mother passed away, the town that she lived in, Wheaton, um, they had implemented this garbage bag tag. For every bag of garbage you went out, you had to put a sticker on it, and that sticker cost a dollar. So if you had one bag of garbage, it was one dollar. If you had 10 bags of garbage, it was $10, okay? How do you think that would go over in Wisconsin? <laughs> over my dead body, okay? So taxes are high, but our fees and charges are like next to nothing, okay?
Okay? That's one thing. The second thing is taxes are bad. Okay? Taxes are a cost. From a, from a purely economic development perspective, taxes are a cost. They're bad. The key is, is that the services that they pay for are a good. They're positive. Okay? So uh, having good roads is important. Having good police protection is important. Having good fire protection is important. Having good schools are important. And not necessarily, not necessarily for the labor supply, but is this a school district I want to send my kids to? Okay? Uh, parks and rec is becoming more important. Okay? Those are all good. So you got positive on this hand, you got a negative on this hand. The question is, what's the balance? Okay? Now there's lots of research on this. And it kind of boils down to do people think they're getting what they pay for? Okay? If I think I'm getting what I pay for, then everything's fine. If you think I'm not getting what I'm paying for, then you got a problem. Okay? Now that's a much more subtle question than simply taxes are too high. Okay? The other thing too is that, I mean, to really cut taxes to the extent that it would make a difference, right? You're not talking, um, what was it that they're saying, the median, the, out of the governor's proposed budget, the median house will have a $5 decrease in their property taxes. Okay? Fulfilled a political promise, but $5 on your property, is that really going to make a lot of difference? Okay? Now, we want to cut taxes to where it's actually making a big difference. Okay, we're not talking about trimming the fan off of government anymore. Okay, what we're talking about is shutting down a fire station. We're talking about shutting down a school. Um, when you start talking about those kind of cuts, suddenly people start standing up and go, wait a minute. No. Okay? The other thing that somebody raised a question about education, and this is, I've, he I've heard this, discussion in Madison is um, when you think about education, um, is educa who benefits the most from education? The, the person, right? The person, okay? okay? Let me get there, let me get there, okay? The idea is the person who benefits the most from an education is the individual, right? It's a private good. If it's a private good, who should pay for it? The individual. Okay? That is the kind of thinking that's going on in some parts of Madison. And it's also occurring across the country. That's a legitimate way of thinking about it. Okay? But what else does education do? How does it benefit society? You've got an educated populace. Making more informed decisions. There's this, what economists call a positive externality, okay? Which means that, um, no, it's not just a private good, there's a public good component to it, okay? We know that when there's a positive externality, a positive public good component to it, the markets won't supply enough. I mean, that's classic Econ 101, okay? The only way to make up for that is to have the government step in and make that investment. This is the kind of debate that's occurring Okay, around education, who benefits? If it's a private individual, then the private individual should pay for it. If it's society, well then, there's a role for government to step in. Or there's a role for society to step in through government. The other thing to consider there is if you don't have a good, well-educated population, they can't make informed decisions and other people will be doing it for them. Yep. It's very true. Oh, thank you. So the, another question is, I mean, I moved to this area because of its beautiful, you know, natural, you know, lakes and trails and everything. I think that's the, a lot of people, either if they're retiring here or if they're choosing to try to find work here, are not doing it, you know, they're doing it because of the nature. You know, how does growth I mean, there's a, like mining, there's, you know, be creating a Walmart and cutting down trees. Like what's the give and take of actually getting a better economy here, but at the risk of taking away 
uh, the reason that everybody wants to be here. We want to we want to promote tourism, but we don't want to become another Wisconsin Dells. Yeah. Um, this is where small business development again is, I think, the key here. Um, and again, it's it's going back to the notion of kind of kind of trying to have economic opportunities. And this is where different people are going to have different opinions. Okay. One of the very first frac sand mining meeting that I attended and, and participated in, there was an older gentleman that was sitting over to the side, and he looked like he was going to have a heart attack throughout the entire meeting. Okay? And towards the end of it, he was like close to tears. And he said, you know, I'm a town, I'm a town chairman. I'm the chairman of the town government. And we just finished up our vision of our town. Finished it up two years ago. And guess what the vision was? Amenities, agriculture, wildlife, all those things that you hold in value here, right? So he says, that's what our vision of our community is. Now I've got, I've got about a dozen landowners that are screaming bloody murder that they have every right to develop their land how they see fit. He's like, no matter what I do, half the town's going to love me Half the town's going to hate me. What do I do? And I said, I'm glad I'm not you. Um, because, you know, this is, this is something that the community has to come to and kind of think about and, and, and think, what do we want to be when we grow up? And one town is going to be, someone said that, uh, you know, Langdon County is different than Iron County, which is different than Bayfield County. And this is where different places are going to come up with different answers. Okay? What's the right answer for here? may be the wrong answer for a town 20 miles down the road. Uh, you said incomes are 85% of state average. What yes. effect would a uh, potential increase in the minimum wage, either flat or tiered, where majors would receive a higher rate than minors and dependents, have effect on this local economy? I'm not sure that a minimum wage increase, first of all, the research suggests that whenever you see an increase in the minimum wage, it does not cost the economy a lot of jobs. What it will do is that it will take businesses that are on the margin, and it may throw them out, okay? But these are businesses that are on the margin, okay? It may not take very much for them to go out anyway, okay? So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that the minimum wage is not the only policy tool that we have. One that, uh, um, actually, he's a colleague of mine. He's in the office across the hall from me. I'm kind of middle of the road leaning left. He's middle of the road leaning right. And he kind of points out that, you know, why don't we use something like the in earned income tax credit? Okay? We could have the exact same effect, but we're not really imposing it on businesses. So I think that this whole idea of, you know, a minimum wage, yeah, it's a way to talk about the question, but it may not be the policy answer that we want. And sometimes we get so fixated on that issue that we can't seem to get beyond that issue. I think one of the concerns that this country has, um, you know, with the income inequality, um, there's lots of discussion amongst academics what's going on here. And economists kind of say, you know, the research suggests that purely from an economic perspective, widening income inequality is not a big deal. It's not going to affect the economy. Okay? It's, just, it's just not. Okay? But what it can do is that it can create political instability. Okay? So it's not really an economic question. It's a political question. Now, um, yeah, I'm going to go this way. <laughs> How many of you have read Karl Marx? Okay? How many of you have read Karl Marx? Okay. What, did Karl, what was Karl Marx's main argument against capitalism? It's that you will see rising income inequality, and you'll see a revolt, and then you'll write back again, and it's just this vicious cycle, right? So what is his, what's his solution? Throw it out and replace it with communism, which sucks. Um, <laughs> the solution is worse than the problem. But Marx's, Marx's political argument is kind of true. 
okay, is that it's more of a political question. Okay? Now, one of the things that this hasn't become a big issue in the U.S. is because of this perception of the American dream, um, upward mobility. Okay? We have it kind of ingrained in our culture that anybody can succeed. Okay? That if you work hard enough, uh, that if you pay attention, is that you can advance yourself and move up the economic ladder. Upper mobility, there's a big study that came out of Harvard and MIT a year ago that suggested that upper mobility is not nearly what we think it is. Some of the European countries have much higher levels of upper mobility than the U.S. does. Um, we get into a whole discussion of why that is or, is or may or may not be. But as long as we think that we have a chance of upper mobility in the American dream, I think that a lot of that political conflict is it's an academic exercise. But that's my opinion. I could be wrong. Yep. <laughs> yep. If you keep feeding people that everybody has the chance to move upward, then we're not going to have a problem. Right? Did I get, did I get that right? What do you think are the impacts of the Affordable Care Act on small business? I think that we have to be a little bit more creative in terms of how small businesses, I think bigger businesses are, are is not a problem. I think that um, smaller businesses, it may be a bit more of a problem. And I think we need to get a little bit more creative with capturing economies of scale. One thing that we were doing a little bit of work on for farmers was looking at healthcare cooperatives where farmers individually can't afford health insurance. They can't. Okay, but what they can do is they can form cooperatives. And through the cooperative, they can capture economies of scale and afford health care at a fairly reasonable rate. Now, is this a Cadillac plan? No, it's not, but it's generally catastrophic. Um, so I think that a lot of businesses, if we can start to get a little bit more creative and think, in terms of how businesses can get together, smaller businesses can come together and, 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 and purchase a plan as a group, I think that it's actually going to work out to be better. Because there's a lot of research that's out there that suggests that uh, one of the biggest drains on the U.S. economy in terms of worker productivity is sickness. Is that uh, people that don't have health insurance tend to be less productive than people that do have health insurance. Why is that? Well, if I have health insurance and I start to catch a cold, or I start to catch the flu, what do I do? I go to the doctor, okay? Um, it may take, I may, get, I may lose two or three days of work. Someone without health insurance, they won't go see the doctor until they get so sick they, they lose four or five days, okay? The other thing is like diabetes, okay? Worker productivity related to diabetes. Now, if you have health insurance, you, you can manage your diabetes. If you don't have health insurance, how expensive is it to maintain your diabetes? Pretty damn expensive, okay? So you can lose worker productivity. So there's a lot of economic arguments to have more comprehensive health care, okay? Um, now, this is something that I think a community could do. I think that this is something that like a, like a chamber of commerce could do, okay? We as a chamber of commerce, what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, try to get a policy through the Chamber of Commerce, and we will allow our membership to buy into that policy. Okay? Now, we've got to get X number of businesses to buy into it, or we can't make it go. Okay? So there needs to be some kind of organization, some kind of institution that can provide an umbrella. And that's where some of those cooperatives are coming in. Maybe a Chamber of Commerce can do that. I know that there's some professional organizations that are even talking about doing that. My brother's line of work is, is conservation work. There's actually the American Conservators Association that is actually talking about trying to provide that umbrella so you can buy into it by health insurance through the American Conservators Association. So people are, you need to be a little creative in terms of thinking about how to do this. What about the national debt? Is it a problem the way it is now? If not, is there a level where it becomes a problem? 
What scares me about the national debt is who owns the national debt. Um, if, if the Federal Reserve Bank owns the national debt, then I don't care, okay? The problem, though, is that China owns most of our national debt, okay? There's an urban, myth, urban story, urban myth. I don't know if it's true or not. I think it's true, but the more I think about it, it might be an urban myth. Um, but I'm going to start, I'm going to tell it anyway, okay? Is that in the 1980s, the Japanese automobile industry decided that they wanted to get into the truck market the small truck market, okay, because what's the number one vehicle seller in the U.S.? Ford F-150, right? What's the number two? I think it's the Silverado. Then it's a car, okay? The Japanese wanted to get into that market, okay? Now, the business plan that the Japanese was following is that we need to establish market share, okay? Now, how do we establish market share? We sell cheap, okay? And then we can, we can lose money, but we're getting that market share. Then once we hit a critical market share, then we can start to rise our prices up. Okay? Now, if you're Detroit, the big three, and you see Japan coming in selling trucks at a loss, what do they accuse the Japanese of doing? Dumping. Okay? Well, it's just a different business model. Okay? Reagan said, you better stop doing this or we're going to put tariffs on you. And this is where the urban myth may come into play, is the Japanese came back and said, well, Mr. President, that's, yes, that's very interesting, but we may have to rethink our position on how much of, our, uh, of your debt we own. Oh, oh, um, never mind. Okay, that's what scares me. Okay, it's not the size of the debt, it's who owns the debt. That's what makes me nervous. <laughs> Something optimistic. Do you have any thoughts or research on a minimum income or a negative income tax for low tax brackets? That's what, in, that in theory, that's what the earned income tax credit is. Is that you actually, they, yeah, we could broaden that out, okay? So actually the earned income tax credit, oh, now some of you knows this stuff better than I do, please correct me, is that you don't pay any income tax up to a certain point. And then once you hit a certain point, then you start paying income tax. Okay, earned income tax credit is that if you make income below that threshold, not only do you not pay taxes, you get money back. Okay, so the idea really is trying to help low income. It has the same effect as an increase in the minimum wage. The question though then is that you have to file your income taxes and you have to apply for the, the earned income tax credit. Okay. Now, a lot of low-income folks don't do that. Okay. Why they don't do that, I don't know, but they don't do that. Okay. Now, this is another thing that a community can do. So there was a story on 60 Minutes, oh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It was a story about a woman that was in South Philadelphia, I think, and she went to college, got a CPA, and became a very successful accountant, right? And she wanted to give back to her neighborhood, her home community. Okay, so what she did is that she took two weeks out of tax time, her busiest time of the year. She took two weeks vacation, which probably cost her a tremendous amount of lost revenue. And she went back to her home community and helped people fill out their income tax returns. And by doing that, she was able to document how much tax returns, refunds, were coming back into the community because she was helping people fill out their tax returns. That's something that a, a community could do, okay, is to get a couple of, of accountants, CPAs in the community say, we will volunteer Friday mornings or Saturday mornings and come in and we'll help you do your taxes. ARP does that now here. Do they? Yeah. Um, are you doing any studies on the effect of Act 10, particularly on uh, rural communities and the shifting of the... Uh, tax uh, supplement that the state provided to rural schools? Uh, in terms of the financing of schools or in terms of yeah, the, and the impact? Yeah, I did a lot of work at the state level and it essentially um, 
I did an economic impact assessment of what Act 10 might be, okay? And I did it for um, one, of the, one of the legislators uh, who ran, he decided he ran against, uh, as a third party candidate, Brent, he, uh, Brent Hursley? Hursley? He was a nice guy when he started off, but that kind of got weird. Um, I did it for him. And uh, the analysis suggested that Act 10 was going to cost the state about 23,000 jobs, right? Nine months later, guess what? The state lost 23,000 jobs, okay? Pure coincidence. Pure coincidence, right? But the lo a local reporter picked that up and had a nice little story. The professor with the crystal ball. Uh, that's taped on my door, you know? Because the, the, I, I said Act 10 is going to cost 23,000 jobs. We lost 23,000 jobs. Two and two equals five. You know, so, so yes, yes, I have. It actually, it actually helped schools. It helped schools get through it. It really did. We have one uh, more question. One more question, and then we'll. So on the one hand, the it did help schools handle the budget cuts but it have, it have a negative economic impact yeah, on local communities. Long term? Can you repeat his question, please? Thanks. It was a short-term solution. It wasn't a long-term solution. It was essentially, we're going to cut you a billion dollars, and we're going to give you this one tool to help you deal with that billion dollar cut. Okay, helped us deal with that. It didn't provide a long-term solution. One more question? Yeah, I just wondered, you know, speaking of who owns the American debt, um, where does the Federal Reserve get its money to buy American <sighs> debt? And if it can just account the, however it wants to, why doesn't it just buy it all back? <laughs> in theory, in theory, what they were doing is printing money. Okay, they were printing money. Uh, the Treasury Department, the people that actually run the presses, that's the Treasury Department. But what the, what the Fed was doing is they were printing money. Uh, and in theory, uh, they can only do that for so long because then what it will do is, is that it will cause inflation. And all the economists were saying, you could do this, it's short term, because if you keep doing it, you're going to spike inflation. Well, where's inflation? It's non-existent. Um, so again, we were wrong. Um, so why don't they keep doing it? They are doing it. But they're slowly backing off of it because the economy is starting to come back. What's the definition, what's the difference between short-term and long-term? Um, Maynard, John Maynard Keynes said, the long-term is when I'm dead. <laughs> um, I had my students read a, a, a chapter out of a book called The Varieties of Capitalism. And um, you know, what it's doing is that it's kind of comparing the, the, the European capitalist model, the Anglo-Saxon capitalist model, which is us in the UK, and then kind of the Asian model. And the big difference really is this short-term, long-term, okay? The U.S. is very, I mean, did you hit your quarterly numbers? Boom, boom, boom. Did you hit your quarterly numbers, okay? Um, the Europeans are more three, four, five years out. The, the Asian model is 10 years out. That, that uh, market share model, okay? We're willing to take a loss in order to get that market share. Now, how long will that take us? Well, it would take us as long as we needed to take, okay? So the difference between, in, in the U.S., the short term is like next month, okay? Whereas if you ask the same question in Europe, it could say that's two, three years from now. You ask the question in Japan, ah, five years from now. Native American, Native Americans, Seven generations, seven generations, 
Now that's really long term. Thank you so much, Steve Deller. Thank you so much. It was fabulous. I learned so much. And thanks to all of you for the great questions. Um, thanks again to all of our sponsors, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, UW Trout Lake Station, Manaqua Public Library, Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and of course the Manaqua Brewing Company. Um, remember our next science on tap will be Dr. Mike McGill talking about uh, heart health on March 4th, four weeks, or yeah, I guess four weeks from today. Um, please visit the library website if you're interested in signing up for the climate change MOOC and um, let the library know if you want to go to the discussion sections. Sign up for our mailing list. If you are interested, please uh, print clearly. And thank you all for coming. We'll see you next month. <laughs>